like to introduce you to our fabulous keynote speaker, Dr. Patrick Hannaway, the Director of Education at the Institute of Functional Medicine. Thank you, Lavinia, and Krish, and Seth, and Russ, and people who have you know, helped me to begin my education about Feldenkrais, the Feldenkrais movement. I, I don't know how I missed the memo. <laughs> I, I've, 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 I've learned many, many different forms of healing. I'll, I'll just share a little bit of, of how I got to where, to where I am right now. I'm one of those, I'm one of those kids who when, um, when I was five years old, I knew I wanted to be a doctor. I don't know why, but I did. And uh, when I finished college and was getting ready to go to med school, was accepted, I said, do I really want to be a doctor? I, I'd really rather be a ski bum and go live and work in Yellowstone National Park. So I did that for a couple years and, and I said, well, maybe I need a paid job. And, uh, and I went to med school. The, the time that I took off was important because I, I had a focus on connecting to the divine natural world and what was really important and connecting to people. And, and when I went to med school, my, my uh, research mentor said, you know, you're, you're too nice of a guy to go to med school. And uh, I didn't know what she meant. But um, I thought that I was going to learn about health and healing and making people well. And when I found out early that that wasn't what it was about, I got really depressed. And then I decided that I was going to take my time, that having these two letters behind the back of my name might actually be useful someday. And, but what I wanted to learn about was about acupuncture and chiropractic and nutrition and hands-on therapies and guided imagery and herbology, nutrition, meditation. And, and that's what I did. And that was, that was like my training ground. So after I finished med school and went to residency in family medicine because it just seemed like, well, I just want to be a good doctor, I somehow, I continued to learn these things, but I had to convince myself that I wasn't running away from being a doctor. So I took a job working with the Yupik Eskimo people on the Bering Sea, 10 doctors. We took care of an area as large as Oregon. And uh, it's all true, you know, with my wife and I, we moved up there, you know, with our six-month-old son, and, uh, and I saw a lot of suffering. And, and I saw people who, you know, the emergency room and the surgery and what we did was not enough to be able to help them. And so when we came back and was on faculty at the University of Mexico, began to focus on holism and integration and walking the talk. And, and the University of Mexico wasn't ready for that in the early, mid-90s. But so we moved to Asheville, North Carolina, and we hung out a shingle here called Family to Family over on Charlotte Street. My wife and I, we've been there for 17 years, and there's some patients from our practice who are there, and you know, some people who have heard about us. And we wanted to help build a model. Um, and when I, we put out that shingle, and people started coming in, and they were sick, and they had a lot of problems, issues, concerns, and I didn't have actually the tools to be able to organize and understand how to put that together. I had lots of pieces, but I didn't have an operating system. And that was when I began to learn about something called functional medicine that was developed by one of my teacher's mentors, Dr. Jeff Bland, who coincidentally wrote the book on nutritional biochemistry that I clung to my first year of medical school saying, there's something here, there's something here. So what's emerged over, that, over the last 15 years has been an awareness that what we're doing isn't working and we need to do something new. And in fact, we've been invited as um, the chief medical officer for the Institute for Functional Medicine was invited to be the first medical director of a center for functional medicine at the Cleveland Clinic. Kind of in the belly of the beast, if you will. You know, 3,300 doctors, 2,000 fellows, 50,000 employees, and 
and we're doing it. We, we started our practice. It has doubled every six months since we've been there. We have 2,000 people on the waiting list. We started with one doctor. We now have eight. We started with one nutritionist. We now have five. We've got two health coaches and you know a staff of 33 people. And we're doing randomized controlled trials. We're focusing on how do we begin with a case series of looking at the neuroplasticity of the brain as it relates to the reversal of mild cognitive impairment of the Alzheimer's type. And we're doing that. I'll show you some slides on this. So it's happening. So I don't know if I said this when uh, I was being asked about, about the tipping point. But I sat down with the former president of, of IFM, Dr. David Jones, uh, about it. Sure, with Dr. David Jones about a year and a half ago. And we looked at each other across the table and we said, it, it happened. The tipping point, we're on the other side of it right now. And you know, so we see this emerging. And so I'd like to, what, what I'd like to do now is that I feel embarrassed because I know in my heart that I just want to share about the stories with you. And I also feel compelled for some reason to try to share with you something about what is functional medicine? What does that mean? And how to do it. So our environment bathes our genes. I'm going to bathe you with some information. Don't worry about the content of it. Just worry about the essence of, of what I have to share over the next 45 minutes. And I'll start with Buckminster Fuller. So he said form follows function. And Buckminster Fuller, along with a couple other people you've heard of, Albert Einstein and John Cage, started Black Mountain College. If you can go to their museum right down on, uh, on Broadway to hear about this amazing adventure that happened in the 50s where they said, let's start a, a school with no structure. It lasted about four years and then it sort of imploded. <laughs> but this, I seem to be a verb an integral function of the universe. And that as Lavinia touched me and I began to learn more about the work of Moshe Feldenkrais and, and, and the work that y'all are doing, I became really deeply touched by it. Because it is about function and how we move in the world. And I hope and it will be moving forward bringing the aspect of the structure function relationship that is really a weak point in the current model and operating system that we have in functional medicine and integrating the aspects of you know awareness through movement and the work that y'all are doing so I'm gonna go through talking about functional medicine we sit at the edge of a tsunami in healthcare <laughs> and we're not really paying attention in the next 20 years, we'll spend $47 trillion. 87% of it will be spent on complex chronic disease. We'll spend $2 trillion a year that it will just be in lost income due to people being unable to work per year. So it's huge. One out of four people have a complex chronic disease. 75% of patients are on, of people, People of all ages are on medications at this point in time. So we see it's just so huge. And what, what are we going to do about it? Where, where do we go with it? You know? So if we were to take how much we're spending on health care here and how much it's increasing, the red line, that's how much it has been increasing. The government says it's only going to increase this much. But we look at how much we had to spend in all of taxes, all of our income, we spend 18% of our taxes. By 2044, we will be spending all of our taxes on health care. It's not working. It's not working. So there's an approach called functional medicine. It's a systems-based, personalized approach. It looks at the underlying root cause of what's going on and works to give personalized, individually tailored therapies 
to restore health and improve well-being. Well, that, that just seemed like, well, that seems like a good idea. How do you really do that? You know, so we're, we're going to see that this, you know, restoring health and improving, improving function is something that we all think is a good idea. Now, when we're walking along in our lives and we're doing okay and we don't have any symptoms, we think that that's health. No symptoms equals health, but it doesn't. Now, when I was in med school, I was interested in prevention and optimizing health and well-being. But what I found was is that people don't go there until they start feeling ill, until there's some suffering that happens. Then they become motivated and they're willing to turn around and walk back and move towards wellness and wholeness. And that's just the, the order, the way we are as human beings and the way in which we can learn. Now, if we keep falling in those habits, as Feldenkrais talked about, and don't listen to our bodies, we'll continue in that direction. But if we listen and can learn and continue to learning, then we have a different opportunity. Feldenkrais did this. When learning, we don't have the intention of being correct. It's about learning. How do we learn and grow? as practitioners, as people? And how do we listen to help in the learning of those who come to see us for help and support? We focus on the root cause. We, I'll talk a little bit about root cause and focus on different causes that we consider. And I'll use this tool that we call the functional medicine matrix model. In it, there are several different components to it. On the left, we talk about ATMs, not awareness through movement, but antecedents, triggers, and mediators. We talk about what's the setup that's going on. Then we look at, well, what are the lifestyle factors that you have? Nutrition being like the, the, the taproot of what we consider. And then we look at where are the clinical imbalances that are going on. And I'll move through those clinical imbalances and, and talk to you about them. But we have individualized and personalized <laughs> therapies for individuals. You know, so how do, we, how do we actually move from, from the one-size-fits-all? So one-size-fits-all medicine doesn't fit anybody. That's the point. So we're working to restore health and well-being. And the point from this quote from the elusive obvious that really struck me is, do you feel you've made the best of what you could with your genetic endowment? Have I optimized my potential in the world to bring forward? So the way in which we do this is we focus on the person as a tree. Now, we may have signs and symptoms of things going on. Oh, I've got a backache, or I've got you know, rheumatoid arthritis, or I've got asthma, or I've got irritable bowel syndrome. And, and then we, we, in medicine, we look at you know, the neurologist, and the rheumatologist, and the gastroenterologist, instead of saying, well, what's happening underneath this? Why don't we start to begin to look at the, at the trunk of the tree? The trunk of the tree saying, where's the function? off and how did you get into this state and let me ask you some questions curiously about what was happening in your life when these symptoms started to emerge the symptoms are our body saying danger things aren't working right suppressing them will only cause other symptoms to emerge at other places and how do we look at these modifiable lifestyle factors with nutrition as I said the taproot, look at the stressors, look at what we're doing with movement, with exercise, with sleep, and with our connections. So this is where the focal point is. We have to look at, at the soil within which we are working and moving in our world. We have to begin to rethink medicine and healing. What if there's no diseases? <laughs> I mean, when someone comes to you, they may have a story about what's going on, but ultimately it's the person who's in front of you. It's not the disease. So how do we begin to think about that differently? So I mentioned before Alzheimer's disease. 
Well, it's clearly noted in the peer-reviewed literature. This is JAMA from eight years ago. This is not even new news. The stuff that gets in JAMA is actually old news, and that was eight years ago. But here they're saying, we don't even have a good classification to understand what's going on with the term dementia. It, it, it doesn't make any sense anymore, and yet we continue to use it. And in fact, dementia, senile dementia of the Alzheimer's type is considered the third, in some cases, and fourth leading cause. In, in where it's fourth, it's, it's over, overcome by, by uh, iatrogenic uh, death caused by drugs from doctors. But we start to look at the whole person. And we start to look at imbalances that relate to infection and inflammation and nutrition, toxin influences that are going on, the roles of stress, the roles of insulin resistance and the foods. And we start taking care of people in that way who actually have the beta amyloid plaque that says they have Alzheimer's disease. We're taking those people. We're not taking the worried well who say, I think I forgot where my keys are. <laughs> Rather, we're taking that subset of people, and he's showing we can reverse, we can reverse changes, not just reverse changes in their function, actually reverse changes in the in the in the structural anatomy of their brain, and the volume of their hippocampus becomes bigger, statistically different, and this is, this is, it's happening. So let's take, let's take another thing. Let's take depression, like this young man here. Well, what is depression? Is depression a Prozac deficiency? Maybe not. Maybe not. In fact, if you were to, um, to read some of the recent, art, recent uh, journals around the, the Emperor's New Clothes, the whole uh, neurochemical, neurotransmitter theory of what's happening with depression has been pretty well disproven completely. You know, yet we still see the SSRIs and SNRIs and tricyclic antidepressants being used, you know, in, in massive doses. But what we see is we see that there is depression that happens in people who have gluten sensitivity. We see that there is depression that happens in people who are taking proton pump inhibitors that, that stop the absorption of vitamins in their terminal ileum. We see that there's people who have depression because of a lack of sunlight and vitamin D. We see there are people with depression who take antibiotics that cause changes in their gut microbiome. We see that there's depression in people who are eating, eating foods that are high in heavy metals like mercury. We see that there's depression in people who are eating sticky buns and it's <laughs> causing insulin resistance and increases in inflammation. All of these can cause depression. And we can go through and a list of here's the paper, here's the paper, here's the paper, here's the paper, here's the paper. Here's the paper. It, that's not the point. The point is like if you got someone with depression, don't you want to check out these things before you start to use something else? <coughs> Beyond which the SSRIs, SNRIs have only been demonstrated to be useful in patients with severe depression who are suicidal. They're not even helpful for people with mild to moderate depression. Little side note found it interesting when the, when the studies came out looking at St. John's wort. Okay, we're going to look at alternative medicine, St. John's wort. And the study comes out and it says, St. John's wort does not work for mild to moderate depression. That's what it was said. And you read through the study, it's like it worked exactly as well as Prozac and Celexa <laughs> and all the other ones. You know, it's like they didn't talk about that part. Anyway, so as we, as we go to understand, well, well what, is the, what is the skillful means? What is the way in which we can find a new path to deal with this? You know, the, the medicine Buddha here who helped to understand the, the skillful means, which was one way of, of Tibetan medicine, taking and integrating. In the 6th century, in the 7th century, the Tibetans got together and they said, let's look at Persian medicine and Greek medicine and West African medicine and Ayurveda and Chinese medicine and, and, the, and the shamanic medicine, the rock medicine that we have here and let's bring them all together and let's hold a conference and let's integrate that and let's develop what will be the roots of, of Tibetan medicine. And I thought, wow, that's pretty cool. They did that. How could they have figured all that stuff out? 
Well, upon later reading, I found that the conference lasted 62 years. <laughs> the people moved there. They worked together as teams. And Tibetan medicine is a compilation of a five element approach of Chinese medicine and of Ayurvedic medicine. It's called Tibetan Ayurveda. It's a way of being able to do that. They looked at function. You can go through the text and you can see that they described what happened in utero from the sixth day on through the full life cycle. They knew exactly what was going on through their methods. There's ways to be able to understand. So what we want to do is we want to work towards creating a new roadmap, a unity of knowledge. You know, we've, we're using tools, the ICD-9, ICD-10, where we name a disease and then we blame it and then we give it a pill for whatever that ill is and then we've tamed it. We've just suppressed it. We haven't done anything. Is the world flat? So we have paths. We can either go through naming differential diagnosis and name what's happening and give a medicine to try to suppress the symptoms that are going on or we can work with trying to understand what's the root cause underneath it. How do we look at imbalances in function? How do we look at the root cause of what's happening? And how do we get rid of that which we don't need anymore and get more of that which is going to nourish us and move things back into balance? So we need a road map. And there's different kinds of road maps, right? I mean, so there's a ro this road map will tell you one thing, this road map will tell you something else. This road map will tell you how to get around uh, around Asheville, and this map will tell you about where the bus systems are, and this will tell you how to be able to walk around downtown and where to go. Different road maps are going to tell you different things. So having a road map that actually focuses on how do we bring function back into balance. How do we move from dysfunction to optimal function? That's what this functional medicine matrix model is about. It's a new paradigm. It's a different way. It's a different approach. One of the key things that we focus on is to not get caught up in all the different diseases that are going on. I've trained, been a doctor for a while, you know, charts would be this big. All these things that are going on, all of these diseases. If I have someone who comes in who's got 37 different diseases going on, am I trying to take care of 37 different things? Or am I trying to take care of and be supportive of the one person who's sitting in front of me. That's what we're working to do. And when we start to see, to look at root cause, as Laplace said, there's a very simple set of rules that are followed. Nature moves with simple rules and continues to apply them and creates a great deal of complexity from it. What's reassuring about that as a functional medicine practitioner as a clinician is that when someone comes in with something new that I've never seen before I don't have to have read the book on that I have to apply a simple set of approaches and look to understand the root cause so those causes those root causes I'm thinking about are is it related to toxins heavy metal toxins, organotoxins, toxic relationships? Is it related to antigens and allergens that I get exposed to and the, and the gut being imbalanced and not being able to deal with what I'm taking in? Is it related to microbes and infections that are present, which will cause imbalances that, that the body will be reacting to? Is it related to nutrition? So as we look at this, we find that there's different ways that those will express themselves through the metabolites in our body, through the turning on and turning off of our genes. You know, it's not about the genetic predisposition. It's not about the, the hand of cards that you got dealt. It's about how you play that hand of cards. So we're going to look at function. We're going to look at assimilation, defense and repair. We're going to look at energy production. We, we talk about how the detoxification or biotransformation pathways work. We look at communication and the interrelationship of neurotransmitters, paracrine, endocrine, hormones, as well as the transportation system and structural integrity. 
I'm embarrassed because we don't really pay enough attention to structural integrity in what, in what I do as a clinician at this point in time. I deeply hope that there will be a, a burgeoning, um, if not a marriage, at least a courting <laughs> between Feldenkrais and functional medicine because we need that. So when I talk about function, one of the ways I like to talk about it is that when I'm talking about assimilation, so assimilation may be breath, it may be what comes in through our skin, it may be the food that we eat, I talk about the earth element and connect that back to Chinese medicine. But I also will be saying that I'm talking about assimilation of, of how the nutrients get in, for example, into the atoms and the molecules and the organelles, the cells the organs, the person, their families, their neighborhoods, their communities, their states, their world, their universe. It's, it's function that's happening at all of those realms. And of course, because the macrocosm and microcosm are intimately related, they're going to be representing you know, what's happening. So as we see imbalance and dysfunction, in our world, of course we see it in the people who are coming to see us, to work with us. So what do we do? Well, one of the things I do, and it's, it's as basic as this, is I take an eight and a half 11 by 11 piece of paper, I turn it sideways and I draw a line across it. I say, okay, this is the timeline of your life. And you'll see in a case study later, I actually do this. This is what I do. We're looking at electronic versions of doing it, but there's something that's very, very helpful to begin to understand and ask stories that says, what was going on in your life? Tell me about the symptoms that were arising and where you were at from a mental, emotional, spiritual perspective, from a physical perspective, and what was going on? And then what happened? And then what happened? And then what happened? And as I listen to that story, I can begin to have a better understanding of well, what are the root causes and what are the levers and where can I go? How do I see where those imbalances are within function so that I can begin to help that person? And we also look at the mental, emotional, spiritual aspect inside of it. Now I talk about this and, and one of the things that I'm working on is that it seems to me if we're talking about balance and imbalance of function, that there might be some merit in the Chinese medicine, not the eight principle medicine that was brought about by Mao, that was through the French working with Mao to figure out a way to be able to take care of the, the billion Chinese people, but rather the lineages of Chinese medicine that went on for 3,000 years, or the Ayurvedic medicine of the Shushutta Samhita that was first written in 4,000 BC, 6,000 years ago. Okay, so if we got billions of people for thousands of years being treated with these kinds of tools, maybe there's something there that we can learn. Maybe. <laughs> Or we could just follow like the Women's Health Initiative where we looked at 50 to 60 year old white women who had perimenopausal symptoms and who were treated with this drug for these 18 months period of time and that, maybe that's better evidence than billions of people over thousands of years. So you'll hear me talk about the fire of inflammation, you're talking about the earth of assimilation and connecting to our nutrients in the ground. Let me talk about the metal of detoxification and energy production. You'll hear me talk about the water and flow and movement of transportation and communication. And you'll, you'll hear me talk about the wood of structure that allows for both sufficient rigidity and flexibility and connecting to the ground. To me, these things are inherent and in that if we begin to work with and listen to the expressions of the divine natural world that the ways in which we talk about healing are easier. We're supported by this. So this is what this functional medicine tool is. It's focusing on a network and a new way of thinking, a new way of approaching imbalance that's happening for individuals. So again, we come back to this tree and we don't focus 
on the branches and the leaves of the tree. Rather, we focus on the trunk of the tree. And in that trunk of the tree we say, well, where are these seven clinical symptoms? And how do I listen to what are the antecedents, the predisposing factors? An example of an antecedent could be the hunger winter that happened in 1943, where people in the Netherlands were, were withheld from food. 20,000 people died. But of the women who had babies who were conceived during that period of time, the effect of what happened to them goes on generationally not from the psychological trauma, but actual changes in the expression of the DNA. That's an antecedent. We see that uh, those who were exposed to you know, the thalidomide babies in the late 50s, and yet we see that, that two, three generations out, the women still have issues going on. Right? So there's this interplay that goes on. People talk about breast cancer and, oh, the, the BRCA gene, if you've heard of that one, you know, the one that, that causes breast cancer. Now, it's true that today, 85% of women who have that gene, only 5% of breast cancers are from that, but 85% of the women who have that gene will go on to develop breast or ovarian cancer. But isn't it curious that the data shows us that for the women who were born before 1940, only 37% of those people will develop breast cancer? It's the gene and the environments working together. So how these antecedents play out, and then what the triggers are, what kind of root cause there was. Is it related to a, a stress, a toxin, an allergen, an infection, or nu nutrition? And poor nutrition that's making a difference for these people. This is way, the way in which I look at and talk to patients every single day and what we do in our center and what the more than 500 certified functional medicine clinicians with about 10,000 in the pipeline, this is the way in which we approach these imbalances that are going on in a codified way. What do we need to get rid of that's not working? What do we need more of? The nutrients, the ability of, of the pancreas to digest the food. Eleanor will be talking about this on, on Sunday, of the, the role of the vagus nerve in being able to stimulate the pancreas so that you can actually digest the food. Well, maybe what you need more of is movement. Maybe what you need more of is openness and awareness and love and community. It's all of these things. It's not just one. And so how do we do this? So this is the part where when I thought that I had an hour and a half, I was going to spend some more time. But I've got an hour. No, that's OK. So I decided, I decided not to take the slides out. But I'm going to just kind of whoosh it right by you here, OK? So. What do we do? We have an operating system, and in that operating system, we first gather. And when we gather, we first gather ourselves to be ready, to be open, to listen, to be able to hear. I've continued to find that when I have a presupposition about what's going to go on with a patient, I'm wrong every time, <laughs> and oftentimes wrong in big ways that don't help the healing to occur. I have to open myself. And I have to gather information. We use a 20 page, 600 item questionnaire that people have, that we ask people to fill out. When we start at the Cleveland Clinic, they're like, no one will ever fill that out. We said, well, how about if we try? So no one will ever fill that out. Well, we're going to do that and we're going to require it. And so 99% of the people, they fill it out. Curiously, the only people who don't fill it out are the employees of the Cleveland Clinic. <laughs> but we're working on that one. And we take that information, we put it on this timeline, and we ask about antecedents. You know, what are those predisposing factors? What happened in utero? You know, simple things like if, you're, if your mom didn't eat enough 
omega-3 fats and fish oils, it actually affects your immune system and it doesn't work properly. There's so many things. There's smoking, there's lots of pieces. You know, what are the triggers? What are the things that were the precipitating factors? And then what are the mediators? What are the perpetuating factors? So often something as simple as a sad standard American diet, which is pro-inflammatory in nature, is going to make things worse. And why do you think these different eat right for your blood type diets work? They, they, it's not about that. It's about vegetables. 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 Eat your vegetables, then you'll get better. So we, we fill out this medic we have people fill out this medical symptom questionnaire. At the end, if I have time, I'll spend a, just a moment talking about outcomes. One of the things in healthcare is that we don't actually have a way to assess our people doing better. You know, and so for example, if we take patients with diabetes and we say, well, the goal is to have your hemoglobin A1C, you know, the little sugar clay, sugar coating on the red blood cells to be below seven. That's our goal, and we're gonna check and make sure you do that. Well, if I'm working with someone on diet and, and they're just using that and their hemoglobin A1C is 7.1 and the endocrinologist is giving them 80 units of insulin to keep their, their blood sugars down, which person is healthier? And their hemoglobin A1C is 6.9. It's not even close. So we're using the wrong kinds of outcome variables to figure out who's actually doing well. So we use some simple things, and I'll talk about uh, some, some new tools that we're using. But we can only demonstrate value, that is, patients are doing better, outcomes are better, divided by the amount of money that it costs to get them there. Right. And so if we can keep people the same for less money, or we can get them better for the same amount of money, we're providing value to the system. In fact, I would say that's why Dr. Toby Cosgrove, a cardiothoracic surgeon, you know, he's a heart surgeon, he brought us to the Cleveland Clinic because he said, hey, we gotta change, we gotta change the cost curve, it's not working. And he felt that we could do that. So we, we ask about symptoms and how things are going on. So we, we look at, we look at the three legs of the stool, literally. We ask about um, what's going on with these antecedents, triggers, and mediators. We, we work to listen to the story and give that back to the person. And then we focus on where's the imbalance and how do we help with, with lifestyle factors. So assimilation, as I said, assimilation is in taking in the food, taking in the air, taking in what you can through your skin. All these are ways in which we assimilate and connect to the world that's around us. We would call it earth. Then there's defense and repair. Again, if you're thinking from the subcellular organelle to the cell, to the organ, to the organism, to the family, like we need these functions, defense and repair. It's right there. So we look at the inflammatory process. We look at the fire that's within. And there needs to be some physiologic fire. It has to be there, but it can't be out of control. And our immune system needs to be in balance with the world around us. It's not about just taking more and more and more antibiotics. We find that as we do that, we're fundamentally changing our gut microbiome and changing our behaviors in the world by taking antibiotics. So it's not about just trying to fight against it. It's trying to strengthen our immune system so that it works. And so we see that there's environmental influence that, that bathe our genes. And this is the key thing. What are we bathing our genes in? Then we look to energy and energy production in the mitochondria, which will be influenced by inflammation, which will be influenced by toxins, which will be influenced by the foods and nutrients that we eat. This is something that... Uh, Hot as it may seem, I look at this every day. I work with this every single day. And I help people with this kind of tool every single day to be able to determine what are the nutrients that you're missing in. These B vitamins, those antioxidants, these minerals. Oh, look, it appears that you've got exposure to lead because this pathway is not working properly. And we define that. We look at toxic load, whether it be from heavy metals or from organotoxins and we look to promote detoxification and the elimination pathways. We look at transportation throughout the system and how that works. 
not only looking at cardiovascular function, but cardiometabolic function. Again, the role of oxidative stress, nutrients, and inflammation of what goes on. We look at communication from the frontal lobes and the hypothalamus and the pituitary gland and how they interrelate to each other. There we look at emotions because it's our emotions that tie to the signals that stimulate the pituitary and the hypothalamus to be able to do their job. We see people who are stressed, who, who have poor adrenal function, but we find over and over again is it's not the adrenal's fault. It's because their brain is saying, slow down. It's not about just throwing hormones at it, but it's understanding what the role of how we work with those hormones are and looking at the electricity and the neuroplasticity that comes through our entire nervous system. And we look at structural integrity again, not just the bones and muscles, but all of the pieces that interact in relationship to that, as well as the body, mind, and spirit, the mental, emotional, and spiritual aspects that go on. And we do that, then we tell the person the story. This is what I heard you say. Time and again, if a patient's crying in the office because they feel like they, someone has actually listened to them for the first time, and that creates hope. So we take this narrative, which includes this timeline that I spoke of, and this matrix where we begin to understand and organize the information in this way, and then we work to order the priorities and create an assessment, you know, create a, a treatment plan. Now the treatment plan depends upon how long have you been sick? What, how sick are you? What's going on? How do we work with this? How do we take away those things that are the triggers and the, the mediators or the perpetuating factors that go on? Let's do that. Then let's focus on food first. Let's make sure that the nutrients that you're getting are the right nutrients. And let's make sure your gut is working so that you're actually able to assimilate and absorb those nutrients so that they become you. Every single cell in our body is new in a seven year period of time. Every single one. You don't have to call it reincarnation, but we're totally different. And we're totally different based upon what, what the intake is. You know, you are what you eat. Some people you are, say you are what you don't excrete. You know, it's like there, you know, there's a balance point there. But if you're taking in toxins and they're, and they're staying inside you, it's hard to get rid of them. And organotoxins, for example, you take in something and we all have been exposed to DDT. Every one of us. If I check your blood and check your urine, it's all got DDE in it, which is the downstream metabolite of DDT. 99% of people in America do. What's the half-life of DDE? 150 years. That means after 150 years, it's half gone. Right? So we're going to be exposed to toxins. How do we help with that? How do we then work with optimizing elimination, optimizing the function of the organs and create a path? a path for change. And that path for change requires coaching and support and behavior change and learning and growth and new ways and new habits. And food is key. Food is key. Because it's not only energy that we get, but it's information that turns on and turns off our genes. One slide I hit is the work of Dr. Dean Ornish showing the turning on and turning off of inflammatory genes in patients with prostate, men with prostate cancer. Unbelievable. The effect of food. It is information. It's also our connection and it's medicine. So I can't emphasize enough the importance of nutrition in what we do. And it's a big part of what we do. So this is a slide that I've, that I've had for a while. But I was thinking about this today, and I, I, I changed this slide. OK? And many of you may recognize this. 
because it's, it's actually more beautifully and poetically said of what the last thing is. And it's like part of the learning. So I'm going to take you through a case study. It's like, well, what does this really mean? Like, okay, you talked about a bunch of things. How do you do it? How do you do it in practice? For the, for the end here. So this patient who came to see me, um, as happens, and she traveled a couple thousand miles, seen lots of doctors over time, and she was pretty sick. You know, had uh, you know, graduated from an Ivy League school, had done very well, as you'll see on the, on the timeline, worked in the Peace Corps. But you see all these things that are going on, and she's not able to function. And these are not many, many different things that are going on, when we, when we looked at the multiple symptom questionnaire, kind of zero to, zero to 25 is, is, is good. 25 to 50 is you're starting to feel bad. 50 to 100 is you're getting significantly worse. Over 100, you're pretty sick. Her me medical symptom questionnaire was 108. And I'm going to show, tell you why I'm giving you that number. So if we look at this timeline of her story, when she was little, multiple concussions, multiple times. Curious new data. Do you know this, Eleanor? Concussions and traumatic brain injury is related to intestinal permeability in the gut. <laughs> Clearly, who would know that? So then she was in boarding school and she had lactose intolerance. And then she was anorexic and she had headaches and she had digestive problems. Then she went to Nepal and she got parasites and all that kind of stuff. And then she was at school. Ivy League school, and then migraine headaches, then after an, an exposure to mold, then she's in the Peace Corps in Sierra Leone where she gets um, malaria and typhoid and then malaria again and then is back and she has continued problems with migraines, um, lots of infections and is not getting better. She's got a chronic infection of something called Pseudomonas that's growing in the back of her throat. So her immune system is totally depleted, unable to deal with anything. And we look at some simple tools, like we look at how's her pancreatic function. And she meets a definition of severe pancreatic insufficiency. If I talk to a pancreatologist around the world and look at that, he'll say, oh, her pancreas doesn't work. The pancreas doesn't work for one of two reasons, one of three reasons. The third reason is that you have a, a, a chronic recurrent pancreatitis of a specific genetic predisposition that I've seen once in my career because I was working with a pancreatologist. Only time I ever saw that. But I see this commonly. Two reasons. Either the villi, which are the absorption points in your small intestine, are atrophied. They're broken down. This can happen with celiac disease. It can happen with other inflammation and reactivity. And so if they're alive, they stimulate the pancreas. They say, hey, pancreas, we got some food coming in, and how about if you release your enzymes? Great. Okay, that's all good. For a long time, I thought that was the primary issue going on with the amount of pancreatic insufficiency that I would see. Also, a curious side note is that kids with autism, very, very poor pancreatic function. We thought it was related to inflammation, what's going on. But what do you think is the other thing that affects the pancreas and its ability to release enzymes? The blank nerve. There you go. Right? And this group gets it. You know, I mean, I can say that here. Because if I said that to a group of doctors, you'd hear a pin drop. You know, they'd have no idea. But it's this autonomic reactivity and responsibility. So we see that her, you know, she's. She's pooping out fat, and her pancreas isn't working. And so any foods that she's taking in, she's not getting them. Talk about earth element and assimilation. It's just not happening. And these are the people that are taking, here's my three bags of 87 nutritional supplements that I'm taking. How come I'm not getting better? But they, they, they got no capacity to be able to you know, digest and absorb. And so we see that her immune system, measured by immunoglobulin A, Deficient, gone, nothing there, less than the detectable limit, as they say. You know, we see that her microbiome is altered. 
Um, we can look at various aspects of the gut microbiome and it's sort of where I've made um, you know, my, my mark over time is in talking about the gut and talking about the microbiome. It's, it's a very interesting thing from a, from a career perspective to be talking about something for 25 years and all of a sudden in the last two, three years, everyone's like, oh, that's so important. <laughs> and I'm like, ah, oh, yeah. She had parasites as well. When we looked at her adrenal function, we found that her adrenal function was suppressed. Again, if I give someone the stimulating hormone called ACTH, adrenal corticotrophic hormone, from the hypothalamus to tell the pituitary to do its job, the, the, the adrenal glands work fine. It's not about the adrenal glands. It's about the signaling to them. But her signaling's down because her brain is telling her you can't keep doing the same thing over and over again. We can look at nutrients and their specialized tools that we use to be able to look at, well, how much B vitamin do you need? You know, and we can dial it in specifically based upon measuring the metabolites. But in this case, I can tell you that until we dealt with her pancreatic issues that were going on, it didn't get better. And the emotional issues that were underneath the pancreatic issues, because even giving her digestive enzymes was not enough to be able to make a difference. So we gave her pancreatic enzymes, we gave her oxbile, we gave her bitters to increase the acid in her stomach, we uh, focused on her gut microbiome, we treated her parasites, we uh, gave her additional probiotics, which I don't always do, though I used to, because I used to think it was all about the probiotics until I recognized that it's all about the food, because the food feed the bacteria that are there. The probiotics are just visitors. They're tourists who come, who live in your gut for 3 to 14 days, and then they're gone. Now the tourists can make or break an economy, to be sure, but they, 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 cannot, they should not be be counted on as sustenance. Whole foods. Roy G. Biv, everyone remember what that is? Great. So when you look at your plate tomorrow of food and you're looking at all the vegetables that are on it, see how many colors in the rainbow spectrum are in there. Because that's what feeds the gut microflora. So six weeks later, that symptom questionnaire, that checklist of zero to four, how you doing, across a bunch of symptoms, she, went, she had a, a two-thirds decrease in her symptoms. We use a tool that's developed by the NIH called the Promise Score. Her general global health was at the fourth percentile of all people. When she came back six weeks later, it was at the 38th percentile. This is a way that we're looking at outcomes to say, are you doing better? Her joints were better. Her brain fog was gone. Now, if we go from 6 to 12 weeks, watch what happens. Boom. The score went down to 22. The global health measure went up to 62%. Her migraines, using a validated score, went from severe to gone. And she had increased energy. Now, there's more work for her to do and more work that we are doing with her. This is just the first step in the process. This is how we focus on learning to help create balance. And so I'll jump through these really quickly and then take some questions. At the Cleveland Clinic, we are running randomized controlled trials in diabetes, getting patients with, di with type 2 diabetes off of insulin. We're doing a, a trial with uh, moderate to severe asthma. So we're working with the specialists. The specialists are working with us. And so there are two patients come in, and the first one goes to just the specialist, and the second one goes to see the specialist and us. We work together. We integrate. It's a collaborative ex environment and experience. Unusual from an academic medical center, I must say. It's, uh, it's, it's quite unusual. So we're doing that. We're doing retrospective studies looking at patients with inflammatory bowel disease. We're doing a case series uh, that we're developing in um, senile dementia of the Alzheimer's type or mild cognitive impairment. And we're putting together clinical practice guidelines to deal with a vast array of autoimmune diseases. So we're having the opportunity to do this. But what's actually going to make the difference is our total cost of care study. Because we're looking at everyone who comes in who we can get their claims-based data on, we're looking at them and saying, 
okay, we're going to measure how much it costs for you to get care for the two years or three years before you came to see us and then since you started seeing us. And we're going to measure your outcomes. No one's measuring outcomes. We're going to measure your outcomes. We're going to use this MSQ scale that we have, but we're going to use this validated tool by, by the NIH that they've put together. For costs, we're looking at claims-based data, and we're also including all the costs of whatever nutritional supplements we may use, and we're only counting it after we start seeing them. We're not even counting whatever they might have been taken before. So it's a negative bias. It's going to cost more. And here's what we've shown so far, is that in a small group of people, about 100 people, we show that average monthly costs have dropped uh, by about 10%. And that's including what we see here is when they come to see us, we do a big workup to say what's the root cause. So including all those things and taking everyone in, we see that it's about a 10% uh, decrease at nine months. It's no, no decrease at six months, 10% at nine months. You know, we're now working out to 12 to 15 months. And what we see is there seems to be a change that happens. So I'm going to tell you about, um, I'll call her Jean, not her real name. 61-year-old nurse who had worked, uh, had been in the ICU, had helped manage some of the systems there, got really sick with mold exposure 15 years before. When we started doing our asthma study or we started talking about our asthma study, the asthma docs were saying, oh, we got a patient for you. <laughs> and I said, you know, I just saw her yesterday. Um, and, you know, she, bronchomalacia means that you're on steroids so much that your trachea doesn't work. You're, you're between the trachea going down into the bronchi, it starts to collapse. You know, and so we see the effects of medicines, and I'm, you know, it's like it kept her alive, but she's been on steroids for so long, and she couldn't see because of cataract secondary to the steroids that she'd been on. So we saw her. We saw her. It was the second week we were there. Uh, I was there, and we changed her diet. We put her on anti-inflammatories. At five weeks, she said, this is the best my lungs have felt in a long time. She came back. She was biking, stationary biking, 17 miles a day. That's crazy. At 18 months, she hasn't had a recurrent hospitalization. She'd been in the ICU three times in the 18 months before I saw her. So here's what we've done. We've done and looked at her cost and said, okay, we've shown the improvements that are there by any measures that the asthma doctors have. Look at what her costs were. Inpatient before she saw us, this is the anchor day, $65,000. And $39,000 inpatient, $16,000 outpatient. Then since she saw us, it was $16,000. So a pretty good drop. I want to tell you what these two bubbles are right here. The two bubbles are, this was where she fell and broke her arm because of her cataracts because she couldn't see. And this is where she finally had her cataract surgery because she was finally healthy enough to be able to have it. So we see the impact of what's going on. And this, I actually didn't, purposely didn't put who said this on here because I actually thought that it had the essence of what Feldenkrais would say. This is another Buckminster Fuller quote. And so how do we take tools to be able to help change the way in which we approach? So at the Institute for Functional Medicine, what we're doing is working to change the way we do medicine and changing the medicine that we do. And I'm very honored to have the opportunity to speak to you tonight here. I so appreciate it and I want to underscore that um, the tipping point is here. <laughs>